All right. Uh, <clears throat> are you all seeing the uh, Jewel Tree screensaver there? Are you seeing that? Not really? Yes, okay, good, good. Uh, I wanted to start with that for the folks who are uh, just coming in for the teaching, because uh, I'll be referring to that. And if you stay around for the next meditation, it'll be up again, because it's, it's a particular blessing from the Tibetan tradition. And um, today, uh, as we, we, it's a kind of ongoing thing we've been doing as we've been uh, meeting together, trying to ex expand our vocabulary of soul and today we're going to include this uh, kind of mysterious uh, thing that most of us are not comfortable with called blessing. Okay, and this is a particular uh, visual blessing uh, that we'll use for our meditation. So I'm going to stop to share now. But it, uh, I just wanted people who are checking in to see that. All right. Welcome one and all. Yeah, good. We're back. Uh, okay, to, uh, to begin, I'm going to, I'm going to rock your world a little bit, perhaps, because uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, introduce you before we get into the specifics, um, blessing, I want to introduce you to a novel idea. You don't have a soul. Novel idea there. You don't have a soul. Well, a lot of uh, politicians the worldwide uh, believe that, of course. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. That's the second half of the statement. So let that sink in. Uh, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. And in actuality, and now this is, uh, this is, uh, many of the contemplative traditions have a version of this, and we're going to lean into the Celtic uh, 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 tradition today with the help of uh, just a, a master, John O'Donohue. We're going to use some of John O'Donohue to help us understand this blessing. But, but get this fact, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. And as a matter of fact, our body, minds, and heart are in the soul. That you got to shake that up. The, the idea that I have a soul or I don't have a soul, no, uh, you know, you are a soul. That's the view from the contemplative traditions. That's the view from Tibet. That's the view from, uh, especially Tibet, among all the Buddhists. They actually have a word in Tibetan for soul. Most of the Buddhists stay away from this because, you know, all of a sudden you got another noun there that you're dealing with. And then if you're this, you can't be that, you know, because our mind does this kind of thing, you know, like on Sesame Street, when Aaron was watching Sesame Street, you know, they would sing, one of these things is not like the other, and then they would show a cat and a dog, or they show a chair and a table. And uh, so that was training the mind to work on the here and now, what the mind does well, which it discriminates, and so we can use words, we don't have to just keep pointing and grunting. We could say, you know, um, there's a dog, or give me a pen, and you don't want the you know, you don't want the mobile phone, you want the, you want the pen, you know. So that's one of the things about the mind and the left brain and the mind is it discriminates. One thing is not like the other. One of these things is not like the other. Well, that's fine for working in the here and now, but for an overall view of the universe in your own life, you've got to put that in check. you got to realize you don't have a soul. See, and that's what the Buddhist, uh, the Buddha was afraid of because they had a lot of different things in Hinduism, but... When the soul becomes a noun, becomes a thing, then there's the soul, and then there's you, you see. And so the Celtic people, especially in Ireland, uh, mostly in Ireland, Scotland too, uh, that tradition, these, these guys have soul. They understand that you are a soul. Again, you don't have one. It's not like a thing you can have. We have a body. We, we have a mind. And uh, we have a heart, and we know we could lose any of those things. They are their verbs too, but they're sort of more thingy than a soul. Soul is immaterial, but it includes all those. That's why when I show that picture of the kind of mandorla shape, and then inside is that radiant light going down to the center of the 
well, that, that's sort of trying to be a picture of soul, if you could picture it, yeah. So anyway, that's that's your original shake up here. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. And we and what we're trying to do is um, learn how to learn how to actually live into that. Learn how to deal with that. Deal with that reality. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna focus on a, a blessing uh, today as another. Uh, if you could, if you know, if you want to visualize the soul. You can visualize a diamond that has many facets. Usually diamond has at least eight facets. And we're going into one of the important facets of, of the soul, which is blessing. Um, so let's explore how we can bless. I'm going to read you four passages from a, a book. I'll put it up on the screensaver later, but it's, 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 it's a, a book of blessings by John O'Donohue. If you don't know John O'Donohue, You'll get to know John O'Donohue in the next few weeks. But here's, this is, it's called To Bless the Space Between Us is the book. But here's here's a little bit of John. I wish uh, you could hear this in his own voice because it's a delicious uh, Irish, West Irish, uh, West of Ireland accent. He says, in the parched deserts of post-modernity, a blessing can be the like the discovery of a fresh well in the parched deserts of post-modernity a blessing can be like the discovery of a fresh well uh, the west of ireland is filled with holy wells blessed wells these are like water gushing up through the rock great image and then they 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 they're blessed they're places of healing in the parched deserts of post-modernity, a blessing can be like the discovery of a fresh well. It would be lovely if we could rediscover our, our power to bless one another. I believe each of us can bless. When a blessing is invoked, it changes the atmosphere. Some of the plentitude flows into our hearts from the invisible neighborhood of loving kindness. In the light and reverence of blessing, a person or situation becomes illuminated in a completely new way. In a dead wall, a new wall opens. In dense darkness, a path starts to glimmer. And into a broken heart, healing falls like morning dew. It is ironic that so often we continue to live like paupers. It's ironic that so often we continue to live like paupers, though our sense of spirit is so vast. The quiet, eternal that dwells in our souls is silent and subtle. In the activity of blessing, it emerges to embrace and nurture us. The quiet eternal that dwells in our souls is silent and subtle. In the activity of blessing, it emerges to embrace and nurture. Let us begin to learn how to bless one another. Yeah, you know, it's quite a lot. And that's just like a paragraph of this whole book. But when John talks, it's, it's rich, it's deep. And then just a, a Just another short thing. He says, who has the power to bless? Well, you know, I grew up thinking, well, priests bless, of course. And, you know, some, you know, that's fine. Or, you know, uh, religious people bless. It's something religious. Spend that. As a matter of fact, Whitman in Leaves of Grass, uh, a line I like a lot, you know, because he was busting up American poetry and American culture, you know, <laughs> around the time of the Civil War. He says, the time of the priest is over. He didn't mean, you know, all the police, all the priests were gone or that they didn't have power, but he was just saying, he said, uh, it's time for everybody to become their own priest. Quite a liberating view that we, uh, you know, the other priests, fine. You know, I've met some, some great priests uh, who really are priests, even, you know, close to being Christian. Uh, 
but uh, uh, you know, but it's time to become our own priest. So he says, who has the power to bless? This question is not to be answered simply by the description of one's institutional status or membership. But perhaps there are deeper questions hidden here. What do you bless with? Or where do you bless from? Now, this is key. I was talking to somebody yesterday, a dear friend, and, you know, we were just on this issue. And I said, well, sh show up tomorrow. You know, what do you bless with? And where do you bless from? When you bless another, you first gather yourself. You reach down below your surface mind and personality down to the deepest depths within you, namely the soul. Blessing is from soul to soul. And the key to who you are is your soul. So get that. Blessing is from soul to soul. Uh, this is a heart-to-heart -heart community. The heart is the passageway. It's the deepest part of the, of our mind, body, and and uh, uh, heart complex. The heart's the deepest, and then you keep going, and you get to the depths of the soul. So blessing is from soul to soul. Okay, well that that's good for a start. Now I'm going to give you a blessing that I wrote. I wrote it was in the Monday thing, but I'll give it to you and tease it out a little bit, and then we'll go we'll go on to learn a little bit more about blessing. I'll just give you a the middle part of this blessing. May you glimpse your true self. May you know your true self. May you embrace your true self. Let's just work with these three lines of blessing. Blessings often start with may. May is like a window into the, into the eternal. May you glimpse your true self. Uh, the true self just means the entire, the whole enchilada, and it includes all the parts of ourself that were orphaned or exiled by other people in our in our kid life crisis. We make a lot about the midlife crisis, but believe me, those years, those first years up to uh, junior high, those first, those especially those first. Uh, weeks and months where we couldn't even turn over. You know, a young American buffalo in three minutes was up on its legs and in seven minutes was running with the herd. Where were we in seven minutes? You know, where were we in, you know, seven weeks? We couldn't even turn over, you see. So we were operating not from that kind of natural instinct, but we, we had the beginnings of a of a mind. And so we we were trying to strategize how to get that woman over there to like us enough to feed us and then to to get to our siblings enough if we had them some of us had a lot of them uh to like us enough they didn't beat us up you know those kind of things and we went all through that through through our life and then you know i remember the first day i went to uh school i mean i really had the world down i thought it at, at, you know age six and I knew how, you know, I knew my mother, I knew my grandmother, I knew how to work them, I knew how to, you know, thrive. And then I was in this room with 60 other guys trying to do the same thing. And there, there's none there who was not my mother. And uh, she would have a whole bunch of different rules, you see. And so kid life crisis, you know, and then there's 60 other people. And some of them were mean and some of them were crazy. Some of them had trauma already. You know, we're, we're all thrown into that. And, uh, and so... You know, as a mind developed, we, we we sort of fit ourselves with, we got rid of parts of ourselves that didn't work with those 60 kids. And so we orphaned them ourselves or other people exiled them. Yeah, you don't do that in this classroom. You know, my two, my two nephews uh, were gay. Well, that wasn't really allowed at that time. And uh, in that family, it wasn't expected. And uh, they both uh, attempted suicide because of it so this is serious stuff and we all have that even if i had pretty good parents you know like my grandmother lived with me we you might have had better or worse parents or only one parent there's a, that's the kid life crisis and a lot of stuff got uh orphaned or exiled into what the the, the psychologist for it and young started the depth psychology it was the unconscious nobody was talking about that there was a place in us 
like a hurt locker where orphans and exiles lived. Parts of ourselves. So when we're talking about the true self, may you glimpse your true self. The true self is the whole self, all of it, you see. And we're to, to become whole. The actual line that Jesus probably spoke in Aramaic got translated through Greek and Latin and all that to become, you know, be perfect as your father in heaven was perfect. Kind of a improvised explosive device for a guy like me who was already thinking, well, I got to be perfect to be loved. But really what, what it, the guy who taught me Aramaic, which was the language of Jesus, his translation, he said, Jesus probably said, be whole as the universe is whole. Beautiful line. And that's really, uh, that's the great work. We'll come back to that. But so may you glimpse this. And you, so it doesn't come at you straight at, all at once. You sort of see little parts of yourself from the, from the corner of your eye, maybe in meditation. Maybe just something comes up and you see a little, little part of yourself. Maybe there's a little jailbreak and a little part of yourself makes it into your consciousness. But it's more like a glimpse. It's more like you see it out of the corner of your eyes. So may you glimpse your true self. And then the second part, may you know your true self. So that's like taking that glimpse and bringing it right here and then being with it. Getting to know what that really, that part of you is like, you see. That's an evolutionary step so from glimpsing to knowing. And then finally, may you embrace your true self. In other words, take this exiled part, this the shameful part, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, once you know it fully and then you integrate it, you, you embrace it. That's a beautiful process. That's my prayer for myself. That's the great work, you see. Especially for you guys who are over 65 or you, you know, you're under this, you know, illusion that you're retired or something. You're not. And so, uh, it's, you know, in, in our culture, you know, oh, hi, I'm Joe. And I'm, hi, I'm Susie. And then you say, well, what do you do? Well, what, you know, that's a little awkward for retired people. Well, I'll give you permission to say I do the great work. And then if they're still hanging with you, you could say, I'm just going to become whole. I'm going to become whole. I'm going to take everything in my, all these orphan parts of myself and bring, you know, you're, you're, you know, you've lost the conversation by that time with most people, but you can maybe listen to this. So you have a work to do. And it's, I'd give the same talk to, to junior high kids if I was still teaching junior high. That's the great work. Yeah, you, you got to pay the bills and maybe you'll have a career and there's, there's all kinds of ways you can impact the world and we'll be talking about that. But in the end, the great work is by becoming whole, glimpsing, knowing, embracing. Can you embrace it? Those parts of ourselves, a little, you know, in the depth psychologists, uh, Freud and especially Jung will tell us those parts of that we see in people that are unacceptable. Well, guess what? Those parts we see in people that trigger us. Well, guess what? That's part, that's one of our orphan selves. And how can they live that? You're not doing it consciously, but those parts that you see in other people that are unacceptable, that's a, that's a trigger. If you spot it, you got it, as they say in the 12 steps. So, so meditate on that. That's a glimpse. That's why people who irritate you are your great teachers, you see. They're showing you something that needs to be not only glimpsed, but known in yourself, you see. That's the great work. So feel free when somebody asks you, well, what do you do? <laughs> I do the great work. And then leave it at that. You don't have to explain unless they ask. You know, they'll mostly say, oh, well, okay, uh, very good, you know. But uh, but uh, try it sometimes. It'll make the conversation lively at least. You know, you'll get the hors d'oeuvre table all to yourself most of the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Now, there's such a thing also as, and that's a great blessing to even understand, all right, this is my work beyond career, beyond paying the bills. This is my work to become whole, to, be, to actually become myself, which is a blessing. When you meet a person who has done this work, I've met some of these people, monks at the monastery. I had one for my uh, spiritual director, Dalai Lama, Merton, these guys, you know, Pema, these, these guys who are on my altar here, 
they're doing the great work if they're still alive or they've done the great work if they've passed on. John O'Donohue did the great work, I'll tell you that. So that's the first part. Anybody can bless. You bless from your own uh, your own soul. You are a soul. You don't have one. That changes everything. That's a game changer. Now, found blessings. Uh, there, there's such a thing as found blessings. Yeah, I'll read you something from down here on this. And uh, you're you're in you're in a found blessing right now. Where can find this. Yeah, a found blessing is like this community we're in right now. How'd you find your way here? Some of you have been here for, I've been here for more than three years. And it just, it just started as uh, uh, some way to respond to being shut in of COVID. And then one way or another, we found our way here and we're still here. So community, he's talking about community here. It's such a privilege to have people who continue each day to bless us with their love and prayer. These inner friends of the heart confer on us an inestimable gift. In these times of greed and externality, there is such unusual beauty in having friends who practice profound faithfulness to us, praying for us each day without ever knowing or remembering it. There are often lonesome frontiers we could never endure or cross without the inner sheltering of these friends. It's hard to live a true life that endeavors to be faithful to its own calling and not become haunted by the ghosts of negativity. Therefore, it's not a luxury to have such friends. It's a necessity. Yeah. So we're, we're, you're, you're in a blessing right now. You know, Saturday morning where you could be sleeping in, there's 27, 29 of us here with the, uh, the live ones here in the, in the Zendo. There's almost 30 of us here who are choosing to be here. What a blessing. Blessings of presence. Don't ever forget that. You, you, you think, oh, I don't know how to bless. When you're present, that's one of the greatest blessings you can be. And then if you open your heart, open-hearted awareness, wow, what a blessing to just listen to person who's, who's hurting, you see. That's what I call found blessing. Uh, Donnie, who says somewhere else in the climate of love and understanding that friendship provides, we take root and blossom into whole human beings. You know, it's very hard to do the great work of solo. You need some kind of community. The more, the better. And this is one of them. And we just found it during COVID. Isn't that interesting? I'm glad you found your way here. Now, a third, the third thing I want to talk about uh, is a blessing we need now. It's a blessing of truth. I can uh, find it. And we're going to work on this just as our final thing, that uh, the blessings of truth. Sometimes when we look out, the world seems so dark. War, violence, hunger, and misery seem to abound. This makes us anxious and helpless. What can I do in my private little corner of life that could have any effect on the march of the world events? The usual answer is nothing. When we decide to do what we can for our own and leave the great events to their domain, you know, the usual answer is nothing. We then decide to do what we can for our own and leave the great events to their domain. Thus, we opt out and join the largest majority in the world those who acquiesce. Interesting sentence there. Thus, we opt out and join the largest majority in the world, those who acquiesce. Believing ourselves to be helpless, we hand over all our power to forces and systems outside of us and then act in our names. 
They go on to put their beliefs into action, and ironically, these actions are often sinister and destructive. We live in times when the call to, to full and critical, uh, critically aware citizenship could not be more urgent. Yeah, so this is a big problem we all face. Some people I know don't watch the news. I can understand that. There's so much suffering. There's so much greed, lying, you know, duplicity, you name it. Uh, and just uh, downright uh, um, hurting other people. And it's hard to watch that. Um, yeah, we're coming up to Monday, a couple days, 9-11. 9-11. Uh, something that means to other other countries too. So we need to rediscover. This is what the, this is what the Donahue says in Redonahue because he understands that we, we all feel that from time time to time, and sometimes that's our that's our set in the world. We're just y'all just do for my family, and then the let the governments do this or let you know I you know there's another view here. We need to rediscover the careless courage yet devastating simplicity of the little boy who in the middle of the numbed multitude in naive Socratic fashion blurts out, but the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> you know that parable of the emperor. The emperor has no clothes. Everybody else was, was eyeing and whatever as the emperor comes by in the cart and he's totally naked. And then the boy said, but the emperor has no clothes. When spoken the words of, when spoken the words of truth could bring down citadels of falsity. When spoken the words of truth could bring down citadels of falsity. So we're talking about the blessings of speaking the truth. Now I want to uh, end with this uh, and develop this a little bit because, uh, you know, uh, a uh, truth, capital T, big truth, um, it's in, you know, it's in short supply. You know, we're used to seeing powerful people on TV just telling downright lies, and we get numbed by it. Oh, uh, oh one of my good friends who has Quaker background uh, told me just yesterday, he said, the, how Quakers, uh, you know, they don't ask you necessarily how you're doing when they meet you. They say, how fares the truth with thee? There's six words, how fares the truth with thee? Yeah, uh, Orwell supposedly said this, although some people say he didn't, but you know, the guy who wrote 1984, where it was just propaganda, just propaganda, war is peace, lies are truth. You know, the whole propaganda machine was going, and he in supposedly Oro said, somebody said it, to tell the truth is a revolutionary act. Think about that today, to tell the truth. And so I want to give you the four levels of truth telling here, uh, just as a challenge, because um, even the first level of truth, and then they go deeper, but even the first level of truth is a terrific challenge that can change your life. Okay, so level one of the truth, you tell yourself the truth. You tell the truth to yourself. And uh, believe me, I bullshitted myself for years about certain items. I wrote around an issue. I write every day, you know, I learned that from Merton, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I write, I wrote every day, meditated, wrote, and I and I, I knew I was writing around not putting something on the page 19 years. And I know that exactly because I know when I finally one day without thinking about it, just writing my ass off, just letting the pen fly across the page, I put it down on the page, I said the truth. And I, it, it struck me that I've been writing around it for 19 years, you can do that. The mind really at its worst is a real bullshit machine. Okay, the heart knows the truth, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there at that time. But anyway, so to tell yourself the truth, first thing. Merton said, you know, somebody said, where would I start with reading Merton? He's got a, you know, there's 70, 80 books. Where would you start? Well, I wouldn't start with Seven Story Mountain for one thing. But I said, you could just boil it all down into this, this one sentence. Merton could write great single sentences. 
He says, uh, uh, we make ourselves real by telling the truth. And he's talking about, first of all, to ourselves. That's why Merton, was every, time, every day, his practice, what he'd sit and then he'd write. Thanks to uh, uh, Debbie Mahoney, who gave us a, a, a talk one day to the group about sitting and then writing a practice we've both done, but she sort of introduced it to. Now we build it into our structure. That's why when we sit the next long sit, we'll do 30 minutes in silence and 10 minutes to write. So you write after you sit. And, uh, you know, you're not so much looking for truth as you just write and some that truth will come out to the page. Tremendous truth. So first way to say it to yourself. Second level of truth, which is even deeper and more challenging, is to tell the truth to one other person. 12-step groups, you have a sponsor. That's key. You do a real inventory your whole life, bring out all the dirty laundry, and you tell this one person. You might have a spiritual director. I had... Uh, a monk at the monastery, Father Gregory, for 18 years, I could tell anything to. And the key the key for this kind of person is, you know you can tell them because they're not gonna judge you. It's the key to being a, and, and it, they have a word for it in uh, John O'Donoghue who wrote a whole book with this title, Anam Kara. Anam means soul in Celtic, and Kara means friend. So this is like, this is the ultimate soul friend. They might not be formal, but there might be some person that you can, and that takes a lot of courage to even tell one other person, sponsor, spiritual director. Uh, a third level of truth is uh, to tell the truth to a community. Could be your family, could be the, you know, some in some sense the people you work with. Here we have a community. That's the really powerful thing about our last meditation today and every every time we meet, no matter what format, is we open up to a, a heart to heart, soul to soul kind of meditation where people have the ability to come out of the silence and press the mute button and unmute and then speak the truth. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of courage to do that. That's the third level of truth. So tell the truth to yourself, Tell the truth to one other person, um, and then to, to tell the truth to a larger group. And then you could guess what the fourth uh, step of truth, to tell the truth to anybody who listens, to tell the truth to the whole world. You know, it's really pretty scary. I remember when I was just getting ready to, to publish uh, my first book of poems, which are my deepest truths. Uh, it was the, the woman's, uh, Alita, who was my layout person, and she was working with the printers and doing all that. She was all ready to go. And I was I was at the phone, ready to pick the phone up off the wall. We had a wall phone in those days. <laughs> and I was going to call her and say, no, wait a minute. I, I got to think about this because it just, I got this, you know, some of the deepest truths are in that book and in all my books. And it I got a little shaky. And I, and I went to, so I didn't make the call. I sat down at the table with blank paper in front of me. And I just, what is this? What is this fear? What is this fear at that point? And I wrote a poem that still is true. You know, the first book was published in 2005, 18 years ago. Some of those poems aren't true for me anymore. That, that poem I wrote that moment was still true. It's, it's called What Matters. I know some of you know this poem. Doesn't matter if the world chooses to accept or reject your, your gift uh, of love. It only matters, it only matters that you love the world in the way you're meant to love it. And so I wrote that down, typed it up, sent it to her, I said, put this in the first one, drop this other poem. <laughs> There's there, and that was the book. It only matters. Yeah, if you, if you really start thinking about how people are going to react, you know, you don't do this stuff. I almost backed off of doing that. But I, I go back to that poem all the time. Doesn't matter if the world chooses to accept or reject your, your, your truth. 
it only matters that you love the world and you, in the way you're meant to love it. And then you, you tell the truth, but that's a really deep level of telling the truth. Start with the first one. So today when, uh, when we, uh, we're going to do another, um, uh, if you missed the morning set, uh, I'm going to intro with somewhere five to 10 minutes of, uh, a Tibetan blessing via the jewel tree, jewel tree, it's a kind of jewel tree blessing that the Dalai Lama, for instance, or people in his uh, uh, order would spend somewhere 45 minutes or an hour doing it. The Dalai Lama, his, his meditation in the morning is about three hours long. You know, this, this guy is, you know, he's, you know, think of the guys who win the U.S. Open, you know, tennis open, you know, this is one of those kind of guys. So he sits for three hours, but the first, 45 minutes to an hour, he's bringing up a real blessing of light. So then he can really feel like he's got a lot of uh, folks behind him. And then, because it's a lot to go into the darkness of meditation. Meditation is always darkness. Doesn't mean just closing your eyes, just means you don't know what's going to come up. And a lot of people leave meditation for that reason, especially a long meditation retreat. I sat with a Dutch Zen master for 10 years and uh, up in Cincinnati, he would come every year from Holland and became a great friend, Hans. And we'd have 40 people for this retreat. And after a couple of days, it was a five day retreat. We had 20 and those 20 stayed. Why did those, why did half the people leave? Well, stuff coming up, they weren't ready for it. If you sit a lot, we sit a lot in an intensive, if you sit a lot and open a lot, Stuff will filter up from that hurt locker, from, from the unconscious. And some of it's disturbing. It's always surprising. Some of it's delightfully surprising, but a lot of it is disturbing. Well, hell, I'm paying for this. One guy said, one guy who left, he said, I felt crazier after two days than when I walked in. I said, I can't take this, you know, but it's, it's because of that. See, this is a great work. The great work is you're, you're trying to bring it all up and then hang with it. The glimpse sometimes can scare you, but then hang with it enough, you know, don't, don't act out or, or run away. Uh, you just hang with it and you get to know it. And to, you know, those, there's a saying uh, to know a, a, know a person is to love a person. What's well, about these parts of ourselves too. And the parts that are scary it takes a while. You have to hang in there. What is this? Yeah. Okay. I'll spend some time with you. I mean, it's like the only way you know anybody. You spend some time with them. You get acquainted. I mean, you all have people. I bet you every one of you has people that you didn't like at first. And you, for some reason you didn't want, and then for one reason or another, you got to know them. And, uh, and then you became friends with them. There's acquaintanceship, friendship, then there's intimacy. So oh, that's the goal of all of this, is to be intimate with who you really are. That's the great work, you see. Yeah. So, you know, these levels of truth, if you, if, you know, most days if I can manage telling myself the truth, that's a victory. You know, you know I, I wake up in a kind of mood and then I'm sour all morning and it's not the truth. But, you know. And then, you know, all the world's against me. We, we do this kind of crazy stuff with our minds. Everybody does it. And that's, uh, that's a kind of sleep. And that's why I, I wake up in the morning and my wake up the morning prayer is, may I glimpse my true self. May I know my true self. May I embrace my true self. So I'm looking for the truth. That's, that's those three lines. You know, it starts with I and then, you can extend it to other people. May you glimpse your true self. May you know your true self. May you look, embrace your true self. And then you can extend it to the whole world. Then you become, a, you become a force for blessing. I mean, look at the world. The world doesn't need another hater. Doesn't need another self-hater. You know, when you don't like yourself, when you're beating yourself up, and believe me, I've got one of the strongest super egos in the world, one of the strongest, uh, like top sergeant trying to whip me into shape at all times. And, you know, the morale, morale, you know, the beatings will continue until the morale improves. That's what this, how this guy works. 
and you know you got to learn how to how to just say yeah no i i'm not i'm not going with that anymore and so if you wake up and you say may i glimpse my true self may i know my true self may i embrace my true self you start today that way it's very simple not churchy you know that's a deep prayer that's a deep that's blessing yourself into the day you see I really recommend trying that. Really make it, you know, and then that reminds you that you're not your mind, you're not your body, you're not even your heart. Uh, you're all of those things together and working in concert. And, uh, and that's, that's what we call the soul, functional. But you will radiate blessing into a world that needs that, you see. Yeah, so. Hopefully this gives you a little glimpse. Uh, we'll, we'll take 15 minutes now, uh, just a break. And when we come back, we'll, we'll do the Tibetan jewel tree and, uh, and then go into the silence and then have some time, some more time to write. So use the 15 minutes here for a little break, more writing if you like. I'll see you in 15. 